Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 75, I continue my discussion with Gene Dolgoff, this time about holography as the next step in the evolution of 3D displays. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded August 1st, 2011, Episode 75 The Future of 3D. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies streamed to your PC, Mac, or TV instantly. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the online editor of hometheater.com. And those of you who are watching the video stream or perhaps the video podcast after the fact will notice that I have dark glasses on. This is not because I want to look like a rock star or um, a hippie or a beatnik. Uh, I had a little accident over the weekend and I've got a real shiner, so I decided uh, discretion was a better part of valor. And uh, so I'm hiding behind my foster grants. Anyway, welcome to the show. Uh, this week's guest geek is Gene Dolgoff, who's making a return appearance from last week. This is, in fact, my very first two-part episode of Home Theater Geeks because we were having such a wonderful discussion about 3D and had just gotten into the concept of holography that I decided I really wanted to have Gene back uh, to continue that discussion. So, Gene, welcome back. Thank you. Good to be back. This is my third time, you know. It is your third time on the show. You are one of the most uh, requested return guests I've had on the show. And uh, so uh, now we have uh, plenty of things to talk about, obviously. Those of you who are tuned into the live video stream at live.twit.tv or logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv can post questions for Gene, and I'll pass along as many as I can during the discussion we have here for the next hour or so. Um, I also want to mention that uh, Gene's company, 3D Vision, at 3-dvision.com, uh, has an offer for Twit listeners, which we will talk about uh, shortly here in our discussion. So, Gene, why don't we start with a little bit of a recap uh, from last week? Um, talking about, we were talking about 3D movies, how, how they're made today, 3D movies and TV. So why don't you give us just a real quick recap of that so we can get going on, uh, on the new topic. Sure. Well, uh, what, what is done today, which really has been done since uh, at least the 50s, uh, is movies and TV shows are shot stereoscopically. So that means there are two cameras. One takes the left eye view, one takes the right eye view. And it is captured that way. And uh, that's the most common way of capturing 3D. Uh, the other thing that is done is you shoot it in 2D and you convert it to 3D. And I'm going to talk a little about the different ways that it can be converted. Once you have your 3D, then there are several ways to display it in movie theaters. Uh, it's displayed on the screen, usually with alternate polarizations, meaning that the left eye is polarized one way and the right eye is polarized the other way, and you wear polarized glasses in the theater. Uh, at home, with uh, today's 3D TVs, there are basically two systems. One is a shutter glass system, which uh, I have some shutter glasses here, and... Uh, Oh, now you're in 3D. So uh, <laughs> shutter glasses uh, blink on and off, left, right, left, right, and the TV does the same so that you get uh, the proper image to the proper eye, and then you get 3D that way. Uh, ultimately, there are 3D TVs that give you polarized images, just like in the movie theater, and then you wear the polarized glasses. Now I feel like I fit in with you. <laughs> uh, perhaps I sh perhaps I should have w worn the uh, the 3D polarized glasses instead of these, but you can still sort of see through them a little bit. Oh, uh, all right. So okay. I, I really didn't want my <laughs> shiner to be shining through, as it were. <laughs> so that's how you see the 3D. Now uh, I mentioned that you could convert. Uh, let me talk a little bit about conversion. 
Yes, uh, which gets a, a lot of press because there's a lot of movies that get converted, and some of them, mm, shall we say, not as well as others. <laughs> that is true. Uh, the technique of conversion is uh, the same basically for all companies except ours. Uh, what they do is called rotoscoping. And uh, rotoscoping means that you take frame by frame, so you take the first frame and you select objects by tracing them with the mouse and cutting them out of the picture. So you select different objects that are going to be at different depths. You cut them out and then of course since you've cut them out you left a hole so you have to use artists to paint in pixels to fill in the hole that was left and uh, once you've cut all the objects out now you have to decide at which depth each object should appear and what you do is you just duplicate that thing that you cut out say it's a person you make a duplicate image of that person and you put it back and now the spacing of those two images is adjusted and depending on what spacing you select, that's going to determine what depth you will see it at. So that has to be done for all the different objects you've cut out. Now, that, that was a lot of work. Now go on to frame two. <laughs> <laughs> and do it again. Uh, now, th this is a very tedious process. And it's true that there is software that helps. So that once you define an object, as long as that object stays within the frame, uh, the software will automatically cut it out again and again and again. So it'll save you some time. And then you have to fill in, fill in, fill in, and then duplicate and separate. Uh, but once an object moves out of the frame, now it's no longer tracking it. So if it comes back in, well, you've got to start all over again. And of course, if a new object comes in, you have to start all over again. So it's extremely labor intensive. That's why uh, a single movie, which might be an hour and a half or two hours, will take about three to four months to convert for a team of maybe a hundred or two hundred graphic artists all sitting there working on different frames and different parts of the movie simultaneously and that's why that conversion costs from five million to fifteen million dollars holy to smokes one movie wow and now you can you can do that with a blockbuster movie but it is totally unacceptable for television and DVD releases if you don't go to the movie first. And that that's posing a big problem for the slowly growing 3D TV industry because the studios and lots of companies have a tremendous amount of content in 2D and they would love to convert it to 3D to put on their 3D TV stations. Right now we have the Discovery Channel in 3D and ESPN in 3D and there are some others too. But that kind of a cost cannot be justified because the revenues from the advertising, which is all they get, you don't pay to buy a ticket on your TV show, uh, that's not enough to pay for that. So hmm. that's where we come in. We have a completely different technique. We don't use rotoscoping. Um, based on our study of the human brain and how it perceives 3D, we do something very different. First of all, we take frames, successive frames, and we compare them. And we look for three-dimensional information. There is actually 3D information in two-dimensional images. And things like degree, things like the size of the thing and whether or not it's size, in focus and so right, on. Right. Uh, as things get further back in depth, they do get smaller. They do get higher in the frame. They do lose brightness, contrast, and color saturation. And foreground objects occlude background objects. So all those in different kinds of cues are the 3D information that we look for. And then once we get all that 3D information, we create duplicate pixels. We do it on a pixel by pixel basis, not an object by object basis. Mm -hmm. And we create double pixels with the proper spacing with information that we got from the two dimensional frames. Hmm. So it still requires an operator it's still computer assisted but all that extraction of 3d data from 2d data is done automatically that's hmm. why we call it auto 3d so we can convert an entire movie with one person in two weeks really two weeks two weeks yeah man it's now, a much faster process. Let me ask you this. Uh, Echo Echo in the chat room is uh, talking about how in 
most 3D conversions, and I've seen this myself, uh, what you get looks like a bunch of cardboard cutouts at different exactly. distances. Exactly. Exactly. That's, that's sorry, exactly the problem. I'm sorry. That's the problem that you get when you cut out objects in the mm -hmm. scene. They do look like cardboard cutouts because you don't get any rounding. You know, if if uh, if something is is starkly different than another thing, you can see that, and it feels like a plane. With our technique, we are comparing frames. And so we are getting rounding information whenever something moves. So we, we actually give you the rounding information and a continuous depth. So there is continuous depth in our images. And you can see it, it, it's just a tremendous number of depths that go into the picture. Mm -hmm. And very important difference, our technique, because it's just grabbing the information from the 2D frames and we're not cutting it out, we're able to represent in 3D things that rotoscoping cannot. Anything that is minute detail, detail like flyaway hair or complex leaves and foliage or things like that, that is incredibly difficult to cut out with rotoscoping. But with yeah, our okay. technique, we don't have to cut it out. And hmm. then anything semi-transparent, fog, snow, rain, ice, uh, glass. fire, smoke, glass that's semi-reflecting something, all those things you can't cut out in rotoscoping, but with our technique, it doesn't have to be cut out. So you get the proper depths with all these different things. So in many ways, it's a more complete, more pleasing 3D than you can get with rotoscoping. Hmm. So that's our, our conversion technique. And uh, the applications, of course, are cinema, broadcast TV, Blu-ray. Right, of course. A and uh, we did this uh, on the Rachel Ray Show. Uh, in a nationwide broadcast. And uh, once we convert something to 3D, we can then encode it into any format. The most common format used today is side-by-side. -side. So we can certainly convert it to, uh, encode it to side-by-side. -side. There are still some applications where over-under is used, and there are applications where uh, page flipping or sequential imaging is used. So it's right image, left image, right image, left image. We can convert it to That's that That's what well. Blu-ray uses. That's what Blu-ray uses yes. typically, whereas exactly side by side right. is uh, mostly used in broadcast. That's right, uh, because of its lower information content, and uh, you don't have much bandwidth in broadcast. Yeah, um, right. So for our technique, where if you have a, a 3D TV, you can use it in the uh, side by side or left right left right technique. But if you just have a regular two-dimensional TV, we have a technique called full color 3D. And full color 3D requires our special full color 3D glasses. And well, here we have an example of the, the Rachel Ray 3D glasses. And uh, they were very simple, but they are special color filters. And these- Now, uh, we certainly know about engineer. anaglyph, uh, pardon me for interrupting. We, we certainly sure. know about anaglyph uh, which is uh, red and blue, or red and cyan, yours use two different colors. Right. We use a very complex green and a very complex purple. When I say very complex, the filters are made with uh, sharp cutoffs and specific curves so that it minimizes ghosting, it balances the brightness of the eyes so you don't get eye strain, and it gives you full color. That's, That's really the problem with, with anaglyph is uh, certainly the, the blue image looks a lot brighter than the red image. Right. Uh, and that does look pretty weird. And you're saying that with this, these two colors specifically designed, uh, the, the total brightness coming into each eye is more equalized. That's right. And, and therefore, you don't get the eye strain. When you have that uneven brightness, it will create eye strain after a while. And you can't wear it for long. And that's why... 3D done with anaglyph glasses is always done in small spurts. You know, put on your glasses now, take them off, and uh, 20 minutes or less. With mm -hmm. ours, we watch it all day, and, and it's not a problem. Uh, so, Gocham, in the, Gocham in the chat room asked a question. Yeah. Does this technique allow any artistic freedom? In other words, can some objects be made more pronounced than they actually are? Can you manipulate the 3D away from what it quote-unquote actually is? Well, yeah, uh, some degree we can do that. Uh, then, of course, there's always the possibility of rotoscoping. <laughs> but uh, we, we 
prefer not to do that because then it would be tremendously time consuming and tremendously expensive. So sure. there's a little attitude of, of, of moving things in and out, but mainly it sticks to the actual information that was there. Mm -hmm. So we've been doing this now for these, these uh, commercial applications, uh, television and uh, presentations and companies. And now we've just started doing this commercially for consumers. Uh, believe it or not, we're doing weddings. So people who have wedding videos uh, can contact us. There's a site called liweddings.com. LI stands for Long Island, which is where I am. Mm -hmm. So at liweddings.com, you just click on unique vendors, and there we are. Um, so that's one way to see what we're doing. But uh, we are going to make a special offer now to your listeners. Uh, we Pray will, tell. We will convert any video you want to 3D, and we will give you 3D glasses. Um, and we will do it at a very low cost. Nothing like what we charge for the TV studios and the commercial applications. And in fact, we're even going to give you a discount over what we've been charging for the weddings videos. So oh, yeah? here's the deal. Here's the deal. As long as you send us 30 minutes or more, it will only cost you $5 a minute. To as opposed to, to what would it normally be? $10 a minute. Ah, so you so it's a half price sale. Half price, yeah. Now, I of like course, it. if it's less, if it's less than thirty minutes, we will still have to charge ten dollars a minute. Um, yeah, understood. You, you know, you need to. Doesn't come to much money. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and now, uh, we will include two pairs of glasses. And if you now want these are the, glasses, these are these uh, constant. Uh, what did you call these glasses again? I've forgotten. Full color three D oh. glasses. Mm hmm. The, which are the uh, purple green. Right. Uh, glasses and those oh, wait, work. Wait, wait, that, but that's wait, there's more. Only, right, but wait, there's more. If <laughs> you have a 3D TV, we will give it to you in the side by side format, which will work on your 3D TV. So then ah. you'll have the top quality. It's there's only in this country, I think, three million t 3D sets sold so far. So if you're one of those three million set owners, you can order it in that format. And we'll do it for you in that format, no extra charge. Wow. Now, will you do frame sequential, which is what Blu-ray uses? Um, you know, full could. 1080p, one at a time, could. you know, one left, right, left eye, left, uh, sorry, left uh, eye, right eye, left eye, right eye. Yeah, we, we'll have to do it if you have a, um, a Blu-ray player that can play that. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to investigate that with each one individually. Uh, but, so uh, nor normally what you would send back would be a DVD, standard definition, correct? If it's standard def. If it's high def, we would send a Blu-ray disc. Right. Or okay. we can also do internet upload and download of big files. Yeah, you, you must have an FTP server or something that people could, could right, sign on right. to and, and yeah, get well, the files we use, that way. We use various uh, FTP programs to do that. Sure. Sure. So if well, anybody wants that, all they have to do is send me an email at gene, G-E-N-E, -E, at 3 dvisioncom So easy. Uh, ask for it. It's easy. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that offer. I, uh, I hope a lot of people take you up on it because, um, I don't know, I think it'd be kind of cool to have your wedding video or um, perhaps not the birth of your child, but <laughs> maybe. Yeah, well, if you're, if you're the parents, you might want that. You might want that. Your kid's uh, basketball game or... Yeah, graduation steps, or, right, yeah, right, or Whatever, right. you know, and your wedding and your sweet 16. Right, right. Your, I think that'd be super video. cool. That'd be super cool to have that as in, in 3D. By the way, when we send you the 3D video, you then can upload it to YouTube because YouTube has a function that allows you to upload 3D videos, and then you can watch them in 3D on YouTube. Oh, cool, cool. Well. Very good. Um, okay, now, we've been talking about the current technology of 3D, um, but, but there are some limitations to any type of current technology that is, is available now, aren't there? Yes. Uh, the problem with stereo, with stereo are the following. First of all, there's no parallax, which means if you move your head to the side to look behind a foreground object and see a background object, it won't work. You won't see anything different if you move your head. No matter where you are in the theater or in your living room, you see exactly the same 3D picture. 
So that does limit the realism, and that's part of why you see cardboard frames, is you don't have that parallax. So that's a limitation of stereo. Then, mm -hmm. as we talked about uh, last time, there's convergence. Your eyes converge on the different distances you're looking at, and your lenses focus at the different distances you're looking at. And those two have to agree. The muscle tensions have to be sensed by the brain and agree, as they do in real life. With stereo, everything is one, on one flat plane, either the TV screen or the movie screen. So it's all in focus there. So your lenses have to stay focused at that distance. But as the double images change spacing, your eyes will converge to different distances. That mismatch between the convergence muscles tension and the lens muscles tension mm -hmm. will make your brain hurt and make your eyes hurt and you will start getting uh, bad effects. And that's another reason why stereo bothers some people or a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Especially the more an object moves away from the plane, whether it's forward or backward, the more the mismatch is and the more uncomfortable it is. So that's a second limitation. And of mm -hmm. course, the third limitation to stereo is you do have to wear glasses. Which so, so many people object to. Yeah, well, a lot. Uh, but there are a lot of people who are willing to do it. And mm -hmm. it's cool. Because it's cool. Exactly. And well, you look cool on, with your glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so very much. Um, so the next part of the discussion then is going to be how can we get around all of that? But before we get there, I do want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this episode of Home Theater Geeks, uh, which is Netflix, uh, which, of course, as we all know, uh, delivers movies directly to your home uh, by streaming uh, that saves you time, money, hassle, and you can instantly watch thousands of TV episodes and movies streamed to your PC or Mac, to your TV, to your Blu-ray player, to your game console. Just about everything has a Netflix app on it these days, so it makes it super easy to get uh, anything you want on, uh, that, that's available by streaming. And you can watch as many as you want any time you want. There are no late fees or uh, due dates or anything like that. So be sure to sign up for your free trial at netflix.com slash twit. And we thank Netflix so much for their support for the Twit Network and Home Theater Geeks. So um, Gene Dolgoff, we are talking about 3D and uh, the state of the art today, but I mostly wanted to have you back today uh, to talk about what is coming down the pike. What don't we have yet? The problems of current technology we've already talked about. You discussed that very well. Um, so how can we get around those problems? 3D will have to eventually get rid of the glasses. Yeah, That's what you need to do and everybody wants that. And uh, it's uh, an essential part of mimicking the reality experience which is what we really all want. We want to relive or live an experience we never lived before in such realism that we can believe that it's happening. And you can't have glasses for that. Uh, of course, you're gonna need parallax and accommodation and convergence have to agree. So stereoscopic won't do. Now, there is another technology which uh, is uh, vertical slices of images. And those can be viewed either through a barrier grid or a lenticular lens. And that does give you parallax. So uh, I'll show you uh, one of those. Uh, let's see if I, can I turn this light box on back here? Uh, and, uh, I, I guess, give it a try. Okay. So uh, those of you who aren't watching the uh, video uh, can see, well, you can actually, uh, Gene is going back to uh, his, uh, back of his studio there, and he's gonna show us something uh, of a holographic nature, I suspect. No, 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 that's it's lenticular. Oh, it's lenticular. Oh, it's like those, uh, like those postcards or children's things that yeah. that you you can sort of put you put it at one angle or another and see one picture or another. Right. So or C three D. Yeah. Okay. So there's a see? looks like a wine bottle or something. Right. Can you yeah. see as I change the angle, the three D changes? Yeah. 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 There's something in front of that bottle. And, and the, the perspective changes as you move the camera around. Yeah, mm-hmm. Right. And Got I'll it. show you a medical image we did. This is a, a real patient. And uh, I hope his, his or her name is uh, 
Oh, look at that. Wow. So you can you can look around their spinal column and kidneys. <laughs> yeah, actually, and... that's the aorta, but you could. Oh, okay. It so it's the heart. Okay. Race. This is MRI right. and kidneys and okay. an aorta. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, you just wow. So you can you can look around. You can as if you were looking going around that person and looking inside them. That's amazing. Yeah. So the lenticular yeah. technology, we've been doing that for a lot of years, uh, can give you parallax, but lenticular technology still is all in one plane. So mm. you still have a mismatch between convergence and accommodation. Okay. So that's still not good enough. Plus, there's a limited angle of view. I don't know if you noticed. You get to a certain angle, and then it jumps because you've run out of pictures. You can only put so many pictures under the lens. Right. So there's the real limitation. Now, there are TVs out today that have been out for, wow, uh, since 2005. Mm -hmm. Different TVs have been made that use a lenticular lens or a barrier screen that does the same thing. And right, you that, that shows you 3D the, without glasses. Right. You have to get to the right spot, though. The distance from it is critical, and the angle of view is critical. So it's, it's not practical for a movie theater, for certain. And it's really not practical for a living room, either, because people could be sitting anywhere, and it's not going to work unless you're in that sweet spot area. Yeah. So that's not going to work. The only place that will work, and it's just beginning to, is with a cell phone. Cell phone is right in front of your and, face. And handheld, ga handheld game consoles, too. Small screens. Right. Exactly. Small screen things will work. As long as you keep your hand still and your head still. Because right. if you move, <laughs> it, it goes out of the zone, and now it gets all messed up and hurts your eyes. And, uh, by the way, the uh, people who sell the Nintendo 3DS, which is a handheld gaming system in 3D without glasses have strong warnings saying if you're under six years old do not look at this <laughs> no kidding and oh, uh, the other companies are, are following with that same warning saying don't look at this display if you're six because they're worried that if they move the wrong way and it goes out of uh, the zone your, your eyes start getting really messed up and the people who are so young who haven't really formed their their uh, the brain areas that govern how they see 3D are potentially going to not form it properly and it could damage their vision forever. At least that's the theory. So mm -hmm. that's why they're covering themselves by saying don't let anyone under six see this. Hmm. So that's what doesn't work. So what will work? And the answer what is will work? holography. Mm -hmm. And um, that brings up the question what is holography? It does indeed. Uh, you know, not many people know what it really is. And I, I, I include a lot of the holographers don't know what it really is. Huh. Wait a second. And, They're doing it. Yeah, because you don't really have to understand what's going on to practice it, to do it. But it, it is an amazing thing what holography is. The world that we see, the, the 3D that we experience every day is there in nature. And it works by the same interference principles of holography. Naturally, nature just creates that illusion for us. So holography has to create the same illusion because it worked exactly the same way. Hmm. That's hard to hard to believe, but you know, I can I can give you some background which will make it clear. It, it this is going to be the first time I think that anybody's going to make a simple explanation of what holography really is. So I'm all ears. We start with just a bit of history. Um, in 1678, uh, Christian Huygens was the first guy to say, you know what, light is a wave. And he started postulating how waves propagate from points in space, and each point is a new propagator of waves. And this is the first guy to come up with a wave theory of light, and he got it right. It's unbelievable. And this now, was the, the only, six, 16th century, 17th century? 17, 1678. 17th yeah. Century. So that was amazing. Now, it wasn't totally complete, and it, it re required one more piece, and that was the interference part. And that was discovered by Thomas Young in 1801. So he did the famous two-slit experiment, and I want to show that to you. 
So here's how that works. We have um, a, a barrier with a little hole in it. Can you see that? Yeah. There's a little slit in it. Yeah. And a little further away, we put a barrier with two slits in it. Okay. Now, the light that spreads out from that one slit now illuminates both slits, and he used sunlight for this. Mm -hmm. And that pretty much makes the light coming out of these two slits coherent with each other. Mm -hmm. And so... Which means, that they're it, which means that their wave crests and troughs are synchronized. That's right. Are aligned. So now these waves, so this, this spreads out like that, and then you've got waves coming out of here, like this, and so on. And on the screen, they meet and they make a pattern, not of two slits, but of many bars. Yes, areas of brightness and areas of darkness. Right, and that is an interference pattern that demonstrates that light is made of waves that are sinusoidally varying up mm -hmm. and down. Mm -hmm. So, um, in 1818, there was a guy named Augustin Fresnel who realized that if you combine Young's wave theory with Huygens' wave theory, mathematically, it explains everything that is observed, and, and it does. So, that was a very important uh, breakthrough in understanding light. Then there was a guy named Ernst Abbe in 1873 who was doing some microscope work and he noticed his interference fringes under the microscope and he made the most important discovery about imaging. And that is this. If you have, let's say, again draw those, some, some slits here. Mm -hmm. Let's say even three slits. That's, that's your simple image, let's say. And um, let's say you put a lens over here, like that. Mm -hmm. is that. Is that visible? Uh, yeah, you hold it up a little bit. There you go. Got it. Okay. So now, the light that comes out of the lens comes, there's a, there's a distance called F. This distance is the focal length of the lens. Mm -hmm. And at F, at a distance F from the lens. From the lens, the light comes to a focus, but because mm -hmm. it's multiple dots or slits, it comes to multiple focus, uh, focuses, which are called foci. foci. Mm -hmm. And then at a later distance, an image is formed, which will be an image of the same thing you started with. Now, what Ernst Abbey realized is that in the focal plane, this weird focused bunch of light that you get is a transformation of the information that's described by a, an integral, a, a specific mathematical process called Fourier imaging. Mm -hmm. And Fourier uh, came up with this and uh, applied it to heat distribution, but Ernst Abbey applied it to imaging. And he said, you get a Fourier transform in this plane, and then you get an image here. So actually what's happening is you're getting two Fourier transforms. First you're getting one in this plane, and then you're getting a second one over here because a Fourier transform of a Fourier transform is the original image. That's an amazing thing about this equation. You yeah. apply it twice and it undoes itself. Huh. Wow. So. This is really key, as you'll see in a few minutes, this Fourier transform, which takes place in the focal plane, is really important because it takes the information from the image and it lays it out in a radial format. This radial and format has different sized features redistributed in this plane so that the bigger features are towards the center and the smaller features are towards the periphery. So it, it just reformats the data from the image into this plane, and it's called a Fourier transform. What's amazing, as we'll talk about, is you can then filter what's in this plane, and you can knock out the small things, for instance, so that when it re-images in the image plane, you now have the same images you started with minus the things that you knocked out. So if you knock out the really fine detail, 
you've now lowered the information content, and that's going to be important if you want to transmit a hologram. Okay, so, so how, I was, my next question was, how does what you're talking about here relate to holograms? The interference pattern, if you record it, is a hologram. This Fourier transform right in this Fourier plane right here mm -hmm. is an interference pattern. And if you record it in any way, like on a piece of film, that's a hologram. And you can reconstruct the final image from that hologram just by putting the light through it. It, the, the hologram, which is two-dimensional, has a pattern on it, which will take that light and diffract it and bend it so that it continues onward at the same angles as it would have if you never put the film there. So the light that winds up in this plane is exactly the same as it would have been if you didn't try to record it. That's what the hologram does. It records the interference pattern in space here, mm -hmm. and later when you put light through it, that interference pattern allows the light to bend and come through so that it, it, it is traveling at the same angles that it was when it hit it. So if the light is traveling at the same angles that it was before, and you look at it, it's going to seem exactly the same as it was And it's going, to, it's going to retain also the three-dimensionality of the image as well. Is that what you're saying? That's right, because the three-dimensionality, as we'll talk about a little later, has to do with the different angles that the light rays are traveling. Mm. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a bunch more time. We, we're not out of time yet, but okay. I think we need to jump forward a little bit here to right. make sure we get to uh, the end of the story. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I know you had some more history to go through, but I think we need to jump ahead here, and I'm sorry about that. But Yeah, okay, that's all right. So we, we have some demonstrations uh, to show. Um, the uh, first hologram, by the way, was in 1891 by Gabriel Littman, and he made uh, a two-dimensional hologram of a full-color image. And uh, then uh, Sir Lawrence Bragg did it with x-rays and uh, in 1929. And then Dennis Gabor came up with light wave technique, actually, uh, sorry, an electron beam technique that uh, did the same thing in 1948. A guy named Gordon Rogers uh, in 1952 did it with light. And then in 62, Emmett Leith and Jurassic Pat next the University of Michigan did it with laser light. And they made the, uh, the light rays at different angles, and that allowed holography to be practical as an optical technique. Mm -hmm. So that's the history real quick. Now, one of the uh, first types of holograms was made by a guy named Yuri Denishuk in Russia. And his technique was the same as Gabriel Lippmann's in 1891, except now he used the laser beam. Essentially, you take a piece of film and you float it on a mercury pool, so it's reflective. And then you have some kind of an object there, so the light passes through the object, hits the film, hits the mercury pool, comes back to the film. Those two beams interfere, and you get an incredible three-dimensional image. Now, I'm going to show you one that I made in 1973, which is just unbelievably real, and it's full color. So now let's see if we can see this. We won't see the three-dimensionality of it. Well, we sort of will. Look at that. It's a gun. It's a pistol. And you, we can actually see, as you move it around, that uh, we can see under it. We can see around it. We can see what's behind it. Um, and you made this image in 1973, you said? Yes. Uh-huh. Wow. And full color at that. That's incredible. Now, so far, so far we've been talking about holograms, and, and they've been pretty much still images. We, we see them also on uh, credit cards. Uh, they were on, uh, it was on a National Geographic cover, I think you were going to show us. Here it is. Right. This was the first time that a hologram was printed on a magazine, and this is using my technique for uh, holographic printing. Um, let's see, can you see that eagle? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep. But these are all still images, so the, right. the real question becomes, how do we get to full motion, full color holography? Well, okay, full color is another issue, and that's, that was more complicated. Now, I, I developed the, the full color technique and with uh, transmission hologram, meaning the light passed through it, and that was around 1970. And uh, here's just an example of a full color hologram. Let's see if I can get you... A full color image. 
Yep, yep, I can see it. It's a clown, right? Yeah. Yeah, very good. There's a lot of rainbow um, sort of background going on there, right. I assume, because of the interference pattern. Well, no, it's, it's not just because of the interference pattern. It's because the way it's done is the light comes at an angle vertically, and there's no vertical information. This, this hologram is actually made from a strip image that is as wide as the hologram, but has no height to it practically. So the white light diffuses in colors in the vertical direction. And since there's no new information, it doesn't blur. It just repeats the information so that you can see it in the vertical direction. Mm. So you get a rainbow image normally. So I came up with this idea in around 1973, 74, to take three rainbow images and make them at slightly different angles and then superimpose them so that either they'll add up to white and you have a black and white hologram. Or if you put them out of registration properly, then you use the red information for one, the green for another, and the blue for another, you can get at one angle a full color image. And uh, that I then collaborated with a guy in holography named Steve Benton, who uh, went on to do tremendous work with that technique and really make good uh, full color and achromatic holograms. Now, I went on to make another technique for printing holograms, and this, nobody has seen this. Uh, it's a full color technique, and you see it's just a piece of just a piece of, of film, plastic, just a piece of uh, plastic film. It's yeah. actually not film. It's it's plastic that I got from the uh, drugstore. It's the cover of a report folder. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, okay, <laughs> but as you can and see, and so what we can see here is full color is, image, incredible brightness and depth. Yeah, yeah. This is a this is a transmissive hologram with light going through it, right? It, well, at the, at the moment, it's yes, it is, but it, it also works by reflection. By reflection as well. And you yeah. can see different things in there, and as you turn it around, you can see uh, different angles on them. And here's another one with uh, a similar kind of a deal. Yeah. Look at that. Look but, but once again, these are, these are all static Well, first you've got to get images. color. Motion is another issue. Yeah. Now, motion is more difficult because then you've got to get a lot of frames of 3D images one after the next. and Because uh, after all, motion is nothing more than a series of still images uh, sent at uh, 24 or 60 or 30 frames per second. Right, right. So to do that, there were different techniques developed. One technique was the cylindrical hologram, which I'm going to show you in a second. And that's a cylinder where the film is wrapped around the cylinder and there's lines on the cylinder. And each line is a hologram of a different frame Mm -hmm. So as you rotate the cylinder, you see a three-dimensional image in the cylinder that's moving. Now, I uh, By the way, before you, before you go any yeah. further, uh, somebody in the chat room says, but that plastic is not photosensitive. How did you get that image onto that plastic? Well, that is our proprietary 3D printing <laughs> technology. <laughs> and we can print holograms. Uh, it has um, to do a lot with the technique on the credit cards, because that was my original technique. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll tell you this, that there are slight variations in the height of the uh, surface, which diffract light in different directions. And, uh, but those, those differences are not, uh, are not predictable or consistent, oh, are they? They are. They're, they are created by the interference pattern when we make the holographic exposure. Ah, uh, 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 I see. Okay. All and right. it could be also predicted by a computer. You can make a computer-generated hologram and the computer can compute what the interference pattern would be if the light rays really existed and met and interfered with each other. Okay, so all right. Either way, so you getting get back the to interference pattern. Sure, so getting back to motion, you're going to show us a cylindrical hologram. Right. Now, but before I show it to you, I'm going, I'm going to tell you what it's about because it's an amazing thing. Um, I was working with uh, Michael Knoll at Bell Labs in 1975, and he was working on an idea of what would the universe be like if there was a fourth physical dimension? And uh, so something, he something I ponder often. I figured that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I do. I actually do. A lot of people do. Actually, I thought about it a lot also. But Michael went to the point of computing, and here's what he did. He said, "Okay, well, imagine you had a uh, a cube 
that was three-dimensional. I'm going to draw a cube for you. And uh, you wanted to show it to someone who lived in a two-dimensional universe. So here we have the cube. Yep. Is that visible? I can okay. see that, yeah. Okay, and now if we put a light over here and shine through the cube and cast a shadow onto this surface over here, that shadow is going to be a very strange looking shadow for yep. the two-dimensional person. And essentially what it will look like is, you know, as you move your hand closer to a light, your hand gets bigger. The so shadow the gets bigger, yeah. The shadow gets bigger, sorry. <laughs> so the face of this cube closest to the light will make a bigger shadow than the face that's further away. Right. So, so the, the result will be, you'll see on the surface, you'll see a square within a square with the vertices connected. Right. And can you see that? Yep. Okay. So that's what the two-dimensional shadow would be of, of a three-dimensional three cube, cube mm -hmm. onto the two-dimensional. Well, what Michael said was, okay, let's say that there's a four-dimensional cube and we're going to put a light through it and then project that onto our three-dimensional universe. What will that look in, like? In other, in other words, cast a three-dimensional shadow. Right. And uh, what it looks like is a cube within a cube with the vertices connected. At least that's one potential shadow that you might see. Right. Depending if on the, the orientation, orientation of the is, light and the hypercube, exactly. yes. Exactly. By the way, and just I just used a word there. The four four dimensional cubes are often called hypercubes, sometimes called tesseracts. Very good. True. So I've just done a quick drawing here of the cube mm -hmm. within the cube. Now mm -hmm. looking at that, we'd say, okay, that's a cube within a cube with the vertices connected. That's nothing special. What's the big deal? So Michael said, Okay. Let's do what we would do to the poor people on the two-dimensional universe who said the same thing. Oh, well, it's, this cube is just a square within a square with the vertices connected, so what's the big deal? And the mm -hmm. answer is, let's rotate the cube in the third dimension and let these two-dimensional people see what it looks like, and they'd see a strange transformation of shape which maybe they could use to figure out what must be happening to this cube in the third dimension. So Michael did this in the fourth dimension. He told the computer to rotate the cube in the fourth dimension. The hypercube. The hypercube. And let's see what the three-dimensional shadow will do. The only problem is Michael didn't have a way to generate a three-dimensional shadow. <sighs> and thus we get to holograms. That's right. beautiful. So, so what he did is he then took the three-dimensional shadows and told the computer to shine a light through that once again and produce two-dimensional shadows. So we got a four-dimensional cube rotating into the third dimension making 3D moving shadows and then that is imaged onto a two-dimensional surface so he had these weird two-dimensional shapes. I took his computer data, his two-dimensional shapes, and I made three-dimensional holograms of each of those shapes in three dimensions so that you could now see in 3D what that shadow is doing. And now I'm going to oh, show yeah. that to you on oh, a moving man. hologram. This is great. So here it goes. So uh, so Gene is going to show us this. Uh, this is the cylindrical hologram you were talking yes. about? Okay, this so it's a series of still images, which are, and the, the actual piece of plastic is in a cylinder, and you can rotate the cylinder and see the, a sequence of these different now, um, if, individual if holograms. Now, uh, he's got to get his camera set up correctly here, and I that's going to yeah, be a so little bit of a problem. So I'm going to vamp while he does that. Um, I have seen this, by the way, a little bit, uh, a couple of times. Um, not, it, it's never been that impressive. I mean, it's impressive. It's impressive as hell, and we're going to see it in a second here. Um, but it's it's pretty rudimentary if you're talking about wanting to see a uh, you know a 3D movie uh, using holography. So uh, tell me, is so it here, visible? Uh, I think yeah. Let's take a look here. Uh, we this this is a piece of plastic that's been bent into a cylinder. It's rotating slowly. There's a light down below it shining up into it. And what we are seeing 
is the image of a four-dimensional hypercube rotating in four-dimensional space and casting a three-dimensional shadow into our universe and this is what that looks and like. And this is and a five-dimensional hologram because it includes four spatial dimensions and the fifth dimension of time. Of time, okay, very good. So perhaps we did have a breach in the space-time continuum, but now we're back. Okay, so I'm, I'm and, glad you can see that. that the, the problem is the hologram has a tremendous amount of information. There is, yes. uh, on, on the, uh, the hologram I showed you of the gun, for instance, that has 50,000 dots per inch in each direction of data. That's a lot of information. Man. So now, if you, no if you want to make a TV for your home, let's say a 60-inch TV, well, 50,000 times 60 in, in one direction, that's a lot of dots of different bits that's of information. That's a lot of dots. And uh, yep. th there's no way that that's going to be transmitted and received and displayed in the next um, one or 200 years. So that's not the way wow. to do it. What you okay. have to do. Tell us quickly how, we, how do we do it. reduce the information content dramatically. And that's why I was talking to you about the Fourier filtering, because in that plane, you can put filters and filter out a lot of information that you wouldn't notice mm. anyway. Sort of what they do in mm -hmm. MPEG-4 that sends TV over a broadcast bandwidth. But this is a much bigger reduction. Uh, and you really use the, the hologram to direct the light rays into the different directions. Because that's the key to holography, is each light ray has to go in its own direction. That's why when you look at one face or another face, you see the difference. Because the light rays coming off of one face have different angles than the light rays coming off of another face. So it's that angle mm -hmm. information that needs to be preserved. And actually, all light rays go at all the same angles, so all you have to do is say, well, let's make a device that produces light rays at all those angles, and therefore you don't have to transmit all that. And then let's just modulate the brightness and color information when you're showing the light at the different angles. So now you reduce dramatically the amount of information that you have to send. And we've already demonstrated this. We can make a system for home and for theater that will be holographic, and we could do it in a matter of two years if we had the funding. And you would have cinema and TV at home that was truly holographic, full parallax, and give you accommodation and convergence differences and uh, the full size. So that is available. Now, would it be... Would it be, would it be would the objects look solid or translucent, as, as they often do with holograms They now? would look solid. You know, the only way something looks translucent is if you have some other light coming fr from the same direction to your eyes, and when you see the superposition of other light and the object light, well, your brain says, well, it must be semi-transparent. So you don't allow any light to come to the viewer unless that light is part of the information of the objects that you're looking at. Therefore, it'll look solid. Mm -hmm. So will it? Will the TV like be a like a black box, a black cubical yeah, yeah, box yeah, yeah. In, in which the image will appear? Except the depth of the box doesn't have to be that much. Maybe uh, just a few inches thick, and so it looks sort mm -hmm. of like the uh, TVs you can buy today that are uh, LCD TVs. Except they won't be one inch. That maybe they'll be three, four inches thick. But otherwise, it'll mm -hmm. look that just like that. And, the and you could do that. You could you could scale that up to a big to a big size for a movie theater. Well, it's not exactly scaling it up. It's a it's a different way of making a different type of hologram because in the theater, what you have to do is you have to have the screen, again like the screen at home, send light at all the proper angles. But here, the proper angles are the seats. So the screen function has to be sending the light to where the seats are. And don't waste any any information sending light into the spaces where the aisles are or in between the seats. So you cut down on the amount of information and you don't have to go above their mm. heads and so on. So right. it's slightly different, but the same principle. You use holography to direct the light at the right angles, and then you don't have to send all that directing information, just the, the brightness and color information. Now, Fubararski in in the uh, that's that's the secret right there uh fubaras fubarski in the chat room uh asks 
care to predict when this tech might be uh, might be available? And you said you could do it in a couple of years if you had the funding. Right. And so since I said that, it's going to be at least 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> because we won't get the funding. And besides, right. uh, the way technology works, it's step by step, little by little. We're just now beginning to get stereo in the home. And uh, right now you can buy a 3D set and there's nothing to watch on it. So it's going to take a while before stereo mm -hmm. becomes mainstream, maybe five years or seven years till stereo becomes mainstream. And then after maybe 10 years, uh, then people will start getting tired of it. And then there will be a lot of development in the holographic technology. We haven't applied for patents on it because why waste 10 years of your patent life waiting for the world to catch up to you and uh, <laughs> start then, you know? That's important. Yeah, Timing yeah. is very important. Well, this has been, we've come to the end of a fascinating hour. I want to thank you so much for uh, coming back this week for part two of our special coverage of, uh, of 3D and this, uh, this discussion of holography and the fourth dimension. All stuff I've been thinking about for years and, and am just having a great time sharing with the audience. Thank you so much, Gene Dolgoff, for being here and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you so much for having me again. You bet. And uh, you can get more information. They can contact me at Gene, G E N E, at 3 D Vision, V I S I O N, dot com, if they have questions or if they'd like to have their videos converted to 3D. That's right. Uh, Gene's offering a special deal to Twit listeners and watchers uh, half price off uh, converting uh, your home videos, 30 minutes at least or more, uh, into 3D of whatever format you like. Uh, and go to 3-dvision.com for more information about that and about uh, Gene's work in all of this. My online home, of course, is hometheater.com. You can email me also at scott at twit.tv. And you can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be Michael Fremmer, who was originally scheduled for today, but who graciously agreed to uh, postpone a week so that we could do this special two-parter. And uh, he is Mr. Audiophile for sure. So uh, if you are at all interested in audiophilia, he's the guy to listen to. And so I sure hope you will join me for that. Until then, geek out.